Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out tonight, a rainy night. See, I didn't know it rained here in this state. <laughs> it's always it's an, a revelation. Um, I'm very honored that you would come out to hear me. Um, when I was praying about what I would say tonight, certainly the topic gives me a, uh, free reign, <laughs> Catholic fiction, the age of illusions. There's a lot one, one could say. And one could say a lot of things very abstractly. Uh, but as, as a, I guess, essentially an artist, a storyteller, I would like to begin with a little story. And it's actually a, a rather f well-known story in Canada where the events occur. Uh, I am a Canadian. I live in <coughs> northern Ontario, about four hours north of Toronto, in, uh, outside a, a very small village in the forested country of uh, Ontario, land of lakes and woods, high hills. <coughs> so there's this story uh, takes place in our Canadian prairies in the province of Saskatchewan. In northern Saskatchewan, oh, many years ago, there was a, a brave young couple went north to build a farm out of the bushlands. So the soil was good, but the, the weather was harsh. Lots of adversity, but they were young and energetic and, and full of great dreams. So this man and his wife, they cleared land and for years, and they built a small house, and they planted wheat, and they didn't know how they survived, but they prayed, and they prayed, and they trusted, and they worked very, very hard. And acre by acre, the farm grew over the decades, and child after child was born to them. And in time, they had five sons. And life was hard, but beautiful. It was, it was a real life and a fruitful life. And uh, as their wheat harvests were, were consistently good, they were able to sell it and, and buy bits of pieces of land, clear more land as they went. And so the farm grew and their family grew. And uh, they often dreamed of the day when, when they could retire and, and leave the, the main farm to, the, to any of the sons, probably the oldest son, and, and maybe some of the other sons would buy adjoining farms or buy farms of their own or clear land of their own. So they had this immense and beautiful and very great dream. However, as their sons one by one uh, became men, young men, they went off into the world to seek their fortune. And uh, one of them went to the eastern maritime provinces and entered the Navy, the Canadian Navy. Another went to British Columbia and entered the uh, Merchant Marine. And then a second son joined the Navy. And then, well, to make a long story a bit shorter, uh, they, all these boys, chose to live a life at sea and, and to make it their lives, which they did. And, and so this, this left kind of a, a kind of a grief in the heart of the mother and father and of the family uh, because they had longed to bequeath this great treasure which they had worked so hard to create. And one day they were sitting at their, their dining room table and just kind of really feeling the loss the absence of their sons, the fact that it would not be handed down. And they were sitting there with their heads in their hands, and, and the father said, where did we go wrong? And the mother said, I don't know. And then they looked up, and they both looked at each other. There above the dining room table was an old cheap painting from Woolworths, of a sailing ship tossing on a <laughs> ocean. <laughs> you see my point. There is a power in images, the images we live with, that affects us at a pr profound level. I'm sorry, can you hear me? I have a no. kind of a voice that drifts into <laughs> silence. So. Um, well, just a little louder. Okay, sorry. Uh, 
and often images have power over the subconscious mind that we really don't recognize. Our eyes glance at the world, uh, they glance at cultural phenomenon, uh, swiftly passing, uh, we register it in our minds, uh, but we, we really, for the most part, don't recognize how images, words, experiences, even the non-dramatic experiences are Im imprinting themselves deeply in our inner life. Um, we are creatures living in an incarnational universe, a universe in which there is a continuous stream of language, of communication, of flow of communication. All communication, really, is human communication, is part of natural law within us, part of the image and likeness of God in us. We speak to each other. We are always communicating in some way or another, even with nonverbal language. Uh, why do we do this? Why are we like this? Is it simply an evolutionary survival technique? Is it only the imparting of data to each other? Why do we do it? And why do we do it the way we do it? Why do we so often, especially in the arts of man, make what we are trying to communicate beautiful? gripping to the imagination of another person. Why do we do that? Uh, I believe that this inherent gift in man to communicate beyond the mere transfer of data to each other is a foretaste of what we are intended for in, e in eternity. And that distant goal, that place towards which the Father creator of us all, desires to take us, is the eternal communion of love, the communio, as it is called. It is that within it, in us, which is imperfect, damaged, blind, deaf to some degree, but in paradise will one day be made perfect in the great flow of love, which is the Holy Trinity, the flow of love within the Holy Trinity, those of you who know uh, Andrei Rublev's great icon of the Trinity, do you, d does everyone here know this icon, the three angels, the Russian icon? Many, many do. Okay, it's probably the most famous icon of the Eastern churches, um, Orthodox churches. Uh, in this image we see three angels glancing at each other, and there is in the, the architecture, if you will, the architecture of the design, this perfect triangle, but a flow uh, of the, the lines, the colors, everything within it is this continuous river of love, which is, which is at once a unity of love, but is a, com a, a moving communion of love, and love ever seeks to be fruitful, which is why God created the angels and the cosmos and his most glorious creation, man, the human person created in the image and likeness of the creator himself. Yet we know that creation is damaged. It is damaged by the fall of the rebel angels. It is damaged most horribly for us through the original sin of our first parents. It continues to be damaged by sin and error and all the fragility of life. And yet, it has been fundamentally uh, rescued by the sacrifice of our Lord on the cross. It is damaged, but it is not destroyed. It never can be destroyed. It is in the process of restoration. And yet, until all things are restored in Christ, there continues to be, until the end of time, this great war, this great struggle in existence, until the final unfolding of salvation history. Uh, not only 
the movement towards the end of time, but also the end of each of our personal histories in this world. Each of us will face a revelation. Each of us, in the pro before then, will will face moments of crucifixion and foretastes of resurrection. Uh, each of us is a great story. Each of us are a unique story. But we are part of an immense drama, an immense, the great story, I call it, the great adventure. But it is a war. It is a war for our souls, and it is, St. Paul calls it, the war in the heavens. In his letter to the Ephesians, he cautions us that we must take on the whole armor of God if we would come through this war and arrive at that place where the Father desires us to be. We are easily deceived in our fragility. Easily deceived. We are very vulnerable to illusion. Now, just hearkening back to that little painting, that beautiful little painting of a ship on the wall of a family home, that was, in a sense, an illusion, but it was also a word of beauty and truth. So it was a good illusion. Maybe didn't things turn out the way the mother and father wanted, but it was perhaps God wanted those boys on the great ocean, the great ocean of existence for reasons only the father could fathom. So it was a good illusion. I, I think also of uh, uh, when my, my children were young, I read to them uh, Tolkien's great epic, The Lord of the Rings, I think five times over the course of the years. Our, our children, our six children are stretch over about 20 years. You know, the oldest is in his mid-30s, the youngest is just turning 21. Um, so uh, I would read to the older ones the epic, and I can remember how my, boy, my old, two oldest boys made gigantic maps on the wall, and we used f colored pens, and we drew all the contours of Middle Earth and the rivers. We drew, they drew everything, really. And then every time we read a chapter or part of a chapter one night, they would trace Frodo's journey that much farther on the map. So they were, they were traveling with him in their imaginations. Does everyone here know what The Lord of the Rings is? Anyone, everyone read the book or seen the films? Okay, please read the book. <laughs> yeah. I'll sign the book after. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I was often moved by the way the children, actually the, the two eldest and the two middle and then the two youngest, as their time came for a success of the next readings, uh, would live inside that tale on, on some level. Uh, you know, e e even when I was reading the older ones in the first cycle of readings, uh, the youngest would be sit sitting on the floor with very large eyes and understanding almost nothing. Mm -hmm. But somehow picking, picking things up, but they were, they were like, maybe almost like little hobbits. They were, they were uh, in a fellowship of something mysterious and dramatic and adventurous and they were allowed to be part of it. Later they came to understand the meaning of words. And even in my old age, when I reread that, that that incredible work of creation, sub-creation, Tolkien calls it, uh, is always revealing new dimensions, new levels of meaning. So there's, there's a powerful grace at work. This was a man who was a daily communicant, who prayed, and a brilliant intellect, of course, a scholar, but in one in whom intellect and spirit, emotion, all the human gifts were integrated in the creation of this work of art. Lord of the Rings and his, his foundational work, The Silmarillion. And so, it has a power over the imagination, a power for the good, a power to not so much inflame or overwhelm the imagination, but invite the listener or the reader's imagination to enter for a time, 
a world in which the atmosphere is more clear, in which the complexity of the modern age is stilled and put aside for a time. And through the power of story and characters, the reader, listener, lives in a purified atmosphere, sometimes terrifying, sometimes profoundly moving. Uh, Tolkien says of, of such sub-creations, he enters a more real world. Interesting phrase. It is a fantasy. It is a fantasy age set in this earth, uh, prehistoric. Much that occurs in it is fantastical. And yet, somehow, there is, there is the breath of reality in it, the deep reality, the, the, the true story in which we are all immersed. And I think when we read that, something within us, in our souls, recognizes this is the story. This, this is who I am. And I think more mature readers are going to say, yes, sometimes I am like Boromir, or sometimes I am Aragorn in my best moments. Sometimes I'm Frodo. Sometimes I'm Sam. And in my worst moments, sometimes I'm like Gollum. <laughs> uh, and so forth. But here is my own story exteriorized in a dramatic fictional form. I can perhaps understand myself in a way and, and ponder and reflect on my, the meaning of my life, the greatness of my own adventure of existence in a way that I might not otherwise do. So when we speak of Catholic fiction in an age of illusions, what I'm intending to reflect upon tonight is the role of the true story, whether or not it's fantastical or, or literal, in an age which is giving us an unceasing tsunami of very bad illusion. I'm speaking of the world of wonder, which leads us to reverence. That is the world of the true story whatever genre it may manifest or incarnate, as opposed to the world of thrills and rewarding the lower appetites of man, and often disordered appetite. The world of truth, in distinction from the world of sweet falsehoods. C.S. Lewis once wrote in one of his essays, in, in a collection of essays on fantasy, uh, a, a powerful little line. He says, sweet poisons do not cease to be poison for all their sweetness, and in fact are far more dangerous than sour poison. I don't want to get too far into specifics of particular works of, of fiction, especially fantasy tonight. Perhaps that could come up in the question period. But the criteria I have slowly, through trial and error, uh, thought out for myself. My wife and I have talked about this endlessly, and we've talked a lot about it with other parents over the years, over 25 years, I'd say. Um, and as the editor of a Catholic family magazine for seven years, uh, I, beginning in the early 90s, I began to receive a torrent of mail from parents just asking my opinion on this new phenomenon that was happening in children and young adults' literature. And that was the, not the rise of fantasy itself, but a change, a radical shift in uh, fantasy literature. Uh, and that precipitated my own serious thinking about what was happening in the genre as a whole. By and large, we would have to say that fantasy literature, which has been in all the cultures of all peoples of all times, uh, is a way that we exteriorize interior questions. 
It is also a way that we taste in, in delightful forms and frightening forms a hint of the war in the heavens and a hint of trans transcendence, that man is more than pu a purely physical being. Okay? We simply do not need literature if we are just clever talking animals evolving into some kind of higher animal. We don't need it for survival. So what is this thing in us that yearns towards the transcendent, that yearns for what is beyond the purely physical? Well, it's written in our, in our nature. And it manifests itself in our arts. We tell stories to each other to lift hope on high when times are dark to enlarge our own understanding of the value of our lives, to pass on hard-won wisdom, hard-won wisdom to the coming generations, and for many other reasons. The imagination, therefore, is, a, for lack of a better word, an interior stage where these dramas can occur and incarnate in our, in our interior life mysterious truths, truths that we cannot live without, we cannot do without. Just before my eyes right now, in my own imagination is flashing another scene from the childhood of my, my own family, um, our youngest son Ben. He was in the, the bottom third of the children for, for a much later reading uh, of The Lord of the Rings. And he had made himself a little wooden sword, which he often played games with. And uh, I'm a great believer that little boys should have wooden swords. <laughs> but you, uh, I don't believe in buying them plastic bazookas that shoot flame. But I, uh, but I do believe in giving them a sword and teaching them a code of honor, preferably making it with them. So uh, either I or, or their older brothers, and sometimes older sisters, would go out in the forest with the younger ones and cut willow twigs and, and create a bow and, and cut uh, arrows and uh, fledge them with their chicken feathers. and. Uh, and go out into the forest behind our house <coughs> and, and have real stories. Re I mean, live, live out real stories. In fact, uh, Ben, now 24 years old, has been doing that with, with our grandsons. So it's, it's really moving to watch that happening. Uh, but anyway, I'm all over the map here. Uh, when Ben was about uh, five or seven, <coughs> maybe, one winter we read The Lord of the Rings and uh, he, every night he would bring his sword to the reading, his little sword, you know, just a very little sword. And uh, his mother had made him, uh, had sewn him an elf cape <laughs> and uh, a little, you know, a little brooch thing to clasp it and, and a little felt hat. And he just very much looked like a hobbit himself. He was a real little guy. And, um, and he never said much, and, uh, but all through the reading, he would sit on the couch with the other kids around the room. He would sit on the couch, just uh, with not much expression on his face, but listening, deeply listening, sometimes with his eyes like this. And, uh, but whenever an orc, the, the monstrous bad characters in the tale, for those of you who don't know The Lord of the Rings, whenever an orc appeared or, or a black rider appeared in the tale, uh, in, the, in the narration, uh, Ben's, I watched his body language out of the corner of my eye. He would kind of sink into the couch slightly and his hand would go towards the, <laughs> the hilt of the sword. And he would slowly draw the sword out and hold it and still, still staring, but I think gazing interiorly into the, the inner screen or stage or <laughs> whatever that is in us. And then when the orcs or other dark figures were overcome, the 
sword would go back into the scabbard and he would continue <laughs> listening. And it was, it was unfailing. He was always doing this. You see the degree to which he was living inside that. Um, <laughs> I, uh, we're in California and a long way from Canada, so I can tell you this. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> but he and his friends from other families up and down the road, also Tolkien fanatics, they had kids about our age, and they all, they all uh, made swords and, and shields. They loved making shields and inventing their own emblems, their personal emblems. And they would often, you would often see them running through the forest like elves and having little wars. Uh, and, you know, we fathers, we tried to, you know, we tried to emphasize very much that a sword is never, ever a weapon for threatening the weak or for overpowering or degrading others. A sword is for the defense of the defenseless. A sword is a sign of honor which you must be fa and it is to that honor and that truth that you must be faithful. Okay, almost a kind of knighthood. And something instinctively, it's very interesting, they, they do need to be formed and taught in that, but something instinctively rises within human nature to the call to this kind of moral character. You can talk endlessly about moral character. You can preach to children about, about it and until their eyes glaze over. But if you give them a moment of incarnating, that call within us to rise and become more than we think we are, to self-sacrifice, to courage, even if they're only living it out in a little bit of pretend. It is writing messages in the interior. They are learning behavior that will stand them in good stead in later life. Herein is where authentic culture in all times and places comes to man's rescue. We may be and should be properly informed about objective truth, especially we who are the, the beneficiaries of all the revelation which God has given to those who would come to him. We have a greater responsibility to teach that truth, truth and love integrated saving truth in a world of confusion. That is our, our duty. And yet, easily can the imparting of the objective truths of our faith in its style, in the form of communication, weaken and become a pure abstraction, can become a kind of dead letter, a true dead letter, but not a living word to those to whom we wish to impart it. It may live in our own hearts, but if we are not, if we are not communicating it as a living word, a flame, a light in the darkness, uh, a sword that glows whenever orcs appear, uh, something is missing. Culture, authentic culture, whether it be a symphony with no verbal, rational content, but which incarnates in a profoundly moving form the great drama of the human journey, the human struggle, and reveals it as beautiful, may instruct us at a much deeper level than the, than the purely rational. A painting, which is not necessarily literal, which is not photographic, may evoke from us a response, an inner sense about a reality which has not ever become conscious to us, <coughs> and yet is part of our interior. I'm often surprised as a painter, uh, when, when people have visited my studio, they'll see, look at some of my work, and people will see very different things in them. And often, often, uh, 
what they tell me they see is, is really that within themselves which is of primary concern to them at this stage of life, or either a primary love, or a primary fear, or, or a primary question. Uh, and it ver really varies from person to person, and is often astounding. And sometimes I am surprised to see in my own paintings something is there that they spotted, and I didn't even know as an artist I was doing that. It's a very mysterious thing. Uh, I, th I believe it is co-creation. It is, it is, in terms of the arts, a uh, kind of grace of co-creation. The grace for the creation of a work of art working with my human nature. So too Catholic fiction, if it is, if it is telling the true story of man, is enabling us to understand our own value, our dignity, even when it must examine the great damage in, in human life, human relationships, the great struggle. Uh, it must always be pointing towards the ultimate horizon. And in the best of work, it is also enabling the reader to become aware of the, the interior horizon. The how, to, how to express that? That the, the, the interior horizon and the ultimate horizon are one horizon. Now, one thing, that the kingdom of God is within us if we are living in Christ. The infinite is, is already within us, not yet in its fullness. When we, when we receive the Holy Eucharist worthily, for a moment we enter paradise. We are entering the timeless. We are entering eternity because we are in union with, with the Holy Trinity. For that moment, through the body, blood, flesh of Christ, the wholeness of Christ. It's only a brief moment, but it's a glimpse of the promised land, the eternal love with, to which we can go if we, if we respond to grace. This is our true story. How much of modern culture tells us very, very different things. We need not <coughs> dwell over much on, on modern culture. I mean, I could go on for hours about that and, and be very specific, but let's, let's look at the basic principles here. Look at even pre-Christian man, pre, let's say pre-revelation man, uh, through natural law, through a, what we might call a natural grace or natural theology in his nature, he produces Homer. Homer produces the Iliad, the Odyssey. And I'm thinking especially of the Iliad here. This, how many have read the Iliad or seen it dramatized? Many. Okay, well, I won't recite the plot, but in it there is the essential human story, is the moral conflict, which continues to this day in all of us, is, is moral character. All these characters in the Iliad the battle for Troy is really about the battle for love and truth, the war, the great war. Now, it's a prefigurement and it's not perfect according to the revelation, the fuller revelation which came later. Fast forward, what, 2200 years or 1800 years, I'm not sure, to uh, the age of Beowulf, the great, the first great epic poem written in Old English, I think. Are there any scholars here? Is it Old English or Middle English? I can't remember. Old English. Old English, thank you. So here's this epic drama. Now it's already the Christian era in England, but they're, they're really creating the myth of this battle against the great dragon in a, in a mode, in a form that is intelligible, that would be intelligible to all peoples, even pagan peoples. Uh, in the book of Revelation, we see, we see those symbols uh, clarified, uh, personified, personifying the great war in the heavens, Satan, this great dragon. The subtle, cunning serpent of Genesis is revealed in the final book of Scripture, 
as the great dragon, with all the malice and cunning of the serpent fully manifest and unleashed in totality against man, this beloved creation of God. If Satan cannot strike at God, he can damage God's most beloved creation, human beings. Until the end of time, he is permitted to continue to do that, which is why we are at war. We are at war until the end of time. And any attempt to make a separate peace with that ancient adversary is doomed to failure. Doomed, absolutely. This is why I'm most disturbed in a great deal of literature, contemporary literature, especially fantasy, and especially fantasy literature directed at the young, that the character of this ancient adversary is more and more depicted as um, not what has been understood by traditional Christian symbology. Uh, we now live in a world saturated in the rewriting of traditional symbols and metaphors of the struggle between good and evil within us and in the world around us. Uh, there are good vampires and bad vampires. There are good sorcerers and bad sorcerers. There are good dragons <coughs> and bad dragons. Um, and more and more we are finding that, uh, I would say overwhelmingly, in modern fantasy, especially aimed at the young, we are seeing that uh, moral relativism reigns. Uh, what Benedict called the dictatorship of moral relativism, moral relativism is not necessarily simply confined to politics or social revolution in education and media. I would say it's, it's, it, its most powerful front is through traditional means of culture. In other words, the arts, literature, now film, uh, etc. Overwhelmingly, we see our heroes. It's very hard to get heroes out of literature. It's so central to our nature. Heroes in, in the 20th century, and now even more in the 21st century, have become anti-heroes, or a mixture of hero and anti-hero. Heroes overwhelmingly are choosing what we would recognize as Christians as evil means, <coughs> evil means to overcome evil. Right there, we have an extraordinary, powerful message. A rewriting of reality, an illusion. And if the author of such fiction is a gifted, talented, well, let's say talented person, natural law talent, imaginative, and creates a gripping story <coughs> packed with thrills and emotional rewards. The package in which this falsehood is delivered into the mind of the reader, we have a powerful uh, uh, mode of rewriting not only conscience, but consciousness itself. So often when you talk to young people today and you get them talking about the world and reality and their feelings, you're seeing a radical shift in consciousness. Consciousness affects how we perceive the world and the moral choices that come to all of us. It affects conscience and conscience in turn affects the choices we make. Now, we're not necessarily locked into that paradigm. God is always at work. He's bringing lots of influences into everyone's life. Divine providence <coughs> never ceases. There's actual grace as well as sanctifying grace. There's people who pray for others. So many things can happen in a person's life. If they crack open Harry Potter or, or uh, Stephanie Mayer's vampire, novels, they're not necessarily going to hell. <laughs> they're not necessarily going to start biting people and cursing people. But the imagination has been inflamed in the wrong direction. 
I would say, leaving aside the whole question of vampirism or, or sorcery and witchcraft, that the underlying problem is the imprinting of a doctrine of moral relativism. Okay. I said I wouldn't dwell on this subject, and here I am dwelling on it. Okay, sorry. Okay, maybe we could talk later. What is the true story of man? The true story, ultimately, is that we face evil. We face sometimes overwhelmingly cha overwhelming challenges, daunting odds against us, in which everything looks like defeat. Um, th isn't this the story that really <laughs> most grips us? The hero with whom we've identified faces overwhelming odds. Is there any hope? And yet something within the heart of his soul rallies, whether it's to a faithful friend like Sam Gamgee or, to or a thousand other manifestations of true friendship in fiction or true love in fiction, husbands encouraging wives, wives encouraging husbands, and so forth, all the great stories of man, we find our courage again. Isn't this the great story? Not that we have some kind of power that can overwhelm and degrade our enemies, but that there is an internal strength of moral character that goes forth in the face of radical danger, armed only with courage and determination to defend and preserve the good. Whatever the story may be presenting as the human good, the true good. So often that drama in its many manifestations means that the hero knows he goes forth into the face of death. And in all likelihood, he is going to die. And that he will not defeat his enemy. That his enemy will overcome him. And yet, by the giving up of his life, he leaves a sign. He leaves a sign in existence that would not otherwise be there. And that there will be those, there will always be witnesses. No matter what evil does in this world, there will always be a witness. I've heard this so many times from survivors of of Eastern Europe in the Nazi period, God always leaves a witness. That sign may have more authority over the imagination of those who are to come after us than all the apparent victory that evil wins in this age. It's not the paradigm of this to be found in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, this moment of absolute defeat. There is the true story. There is the greatest story ever told, to borrow a phrase. We are inside the great story. We are part of the great story. An authentic culture awakens within us an awareness of this, even when it does not penetrate to the rational mind or, or, uh, or, or can be articulated, suddenly we are more than we thought we were. M I've known many, many Eastern Europeans and Central Europeans in my life, and they've all said many important things, but among them has, one, has been one that, that strikes me powerfully. In all those countries where totalitarianism of various kinds reigned, culture became the last sanctuary. It became the place of refuge where man could feel his humanity, could, could experience beauty. Okay. Even when it had no political or philosophical content, even if the listener to a symphony, let's say, uh, in, in, in a concert hall in, in Poland or East Germany or elsewhere is, is 
has never been formed in the faith or has only been imbued with the indoctrination. He's sitting in a symphony. He's been told he's a cell in a collective. That's all he is, component in a vast deterministic dialectic of history. It's a lie. It's an illusion. But he may have no other way of seeing beyond the tyranny of the lie. So he's, there he is. He's sitting in the concert hall. And he hears some musician playing with their whole heart and a mass of hidden labor and practice, years of it, pouring forth the soul of the composer and the performer's soul as well, united to it, a musical score that has no political content. But suddenly the person sitting in the audience begins to weep. Why are they weeping? It may not even be a romantic piece. Something in the heart of the soul has been touched by a language of the spirit. And that person who has been, uh, been denied the truth is experiencing at a deep level the truth incarnate in a form that has no uh, rational language attached to it. It is a flow of language. It is a flow of celestial language through the arts because it is beautiful and true. That person leaves that hall not knowing why he wept, why he was so moved, but he leaves it changed. He knows at some deep level that he is more than he thought he was. He is more richer and deeper than the state tells him he is. He knows he is not a cell in a collective. And we in the West, though we have freedom everywhere, the illusion of infinite freedom, a fast-fading illusion, I might say. Our risk, I would, I would suggest, is that we have been told the lie that we are biomechanisms, that we are pleasure machines, clever machines, which can be programmed with a great deal of data, this is our form of the lie. We have become a people who feed on thrills. And we have lost our capacity for silence and reverence. And as a result, our capacity for the sense of wonder. All true culture evokes from us this sense of wonder before mystery. It leads upwards. It leads towards the true horizon, even when we can't rationally know that. It's leading us. It's showing, showing us the way. Wonder. Plato says that wonder is the origin of philosophy. We fall silent and reverent before a phenomenon that is there. It exists. We don't know why it exists. We don't know why it's beautiful. Why, why do I perceive it as beautiful? Why do I come to love it? How do I know it? How do I understand it? It's philosophy. The poet comes at the same mystery from a different direction, through the beauty of words, the music embedded in poetics, in poetry. Music does it very, very powerfully, through the emotions, through other senses. Fiction does it still another way, by engaging the imagination, sparking it without inflaming it or overpowering it, inviting us to enter in to a deeper understanding of the true story, understanding our own greatness and poverty, looking upon ourselves with greater compassion and with greater honesty. We make a great mistake, a mistake which dominates our times, in relegating culture to the realm of entertainment. 
highbrow entertainment, lowbrow entertainment, but a, a diversion, a pleasant, deep, intellectual, shallow comic books, Shakespeare, anything. How do we approach these things? Do we approach them with a sense of deep listening and reverence, attention, an inner attention, a silence? Or are we just gobbling more entertainment, gobbling, consuming, consuming these things which are often born from the heart of a creator at great cost? Have we cooperated with the logic of the machine, all that in the modern age that would turn us into mechanisms, biomechanisms? I leave that as a question. I would like to conclude with a reference to one of the most powerful talks that Cardinal Ratzinger ever gave. Well, gosh, he's given thousands of powerful talks, but one that hit me most powerfully. It was one he gave in the year 2000 in Palermo, Sicily, to a group of young seminarians and priests. Uh, in March of 2000. You can still find it on Zenit News. I think if it's still there, uh, it was March 2000. He gave this talk on fatherhood and apocalypse. An intriguing title. In it, then Cardinal Ratzinger is positing uh, the contours of the great struggle which is, which is amassing in our times. He it goes so far, extremist that he is, to say that we are facing a great phase, perhaps the definitive phase, of the struggle between the Father, the will of the Father, God the Father, and the beast of the book of Revelation. And he says, uh, Ratzinger says, <coughs> when God looks at man, at each of us, he knows our name. He sees each of us as unique, unrepeatable, never before seen, never to be repeated. When he looks at us as humanity and as individuals without exception, he sees persons with a name. The mind of Antichrist, whether it's the spirit of Antichrist, which has always been with us, or that era when it shall incarnate in the form of a man, the scripture says the man of sin. The spirit of Antichrist and Antichrist look at us and they see numbers. The beast in Revelation, says Ratzinger, does not have a name. He is simply the beast, and he has a number. And he seeks, the Cardinal warns, the Holy Father warns, he seeks to turn us into numbers, because when we are rendered down to the world of objects, we are more easily manipulated, controlled, and destroyed. He warned that the age of the machine, the thinking machine, the computer, runs a very great risk of turning absolutely everything into the realm of the beast. <coughs> he refers back briefly in this talk to Auschwitz. <coughs> the inmates of Auschwitz, those that survived the gas chambers for a while, were tattooed with numbers. They had no names. They were numbers, <coughs> more easily disposed of, without conscience. They were dehumanized. There are no concentration camps visible. There are no book burnings in the streets of our cities. There are no jackboots. There's no roundups. There's no people disappearing, at least in this country, as far as I know. But the realm of Antichrist will be a realm of illusion. 
taken <coughs> to an ultimate level. <coughs> Scripture says that unless that time be shortened, even the elect will be deceived. Even the chosen of God will be deceived. That is how subtle it will be. It is therefore incumbent upon us, as it is in every generation, to stay awake and watch, to be vigilant, to be particularly vigilant about anything that would render us down into the realm of objects, anything that would deprive us of our true story, anything that would degrade the meaning of our personhood, anything that would poison us with sweet, sweet lies. That is his warning. It is also an underlining of the urgency of those who live in Christ, the, the Christian community, the body of Christ in this world, <clears throat> to put as much labor and sacrifice and response to grace as possible to the creation of authentic culture, to bring about a new restoration. If God should grant us that great gift, the generations to come need to be fed good food. They need to be told the true story. And so, please, please pray for this great restoration. It is always possible, and it may yet come. So thank you. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>